So today I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, observability and specifically full stack observability. And we'll deep dive into a launch which we did this morning in the keynote. So who all went for the keynote? I did not. Keynote, keynote, okay. And did you hear Liz talking about FSO or full stack observability? Okay, great, awesome. So I will take over from Liz and talk about what is full stack observability, talk about the platform, and uh, we'll kind of go into the details and then followed by that we'll have Randy and others who will join me and talk about security and other topics as well within the context of full stack observability. This is the most important slide, so make sure you have a picture of this. No, I'm just kidding. My name is Sunny Dua, I'm a product manager for Cisco Ag Dynamics. I've uh, been in the industry for close to 20 years, and I blog as well on sunnydua.com, so whatever I'm talking over here, I do ramblings on my personal blog as well. Uh, please come and visit and click on the ads on the right-hand side so that I can get some revenue. Uh, <laughs> all right, so let's move on and talk about uh, the real topic. So, you might be coming to this conference and you might be using multiple applications to come here, right? From using Uber or using your applications to book a flight ticket and so on and so forth. So the reality is that applications are the front door to any business. And if you are running a digital business, it's important for you to, able, to be able to provide a seamless experience to your customers who are interacting with you, not on a kiosk anymore or not in your office, but through the applications which you are creating for your businesses. Um, the reality is that these applications have become really complex over a period of time. Gone are the days when the application was a client server based application running in a small office room and everything was connected to it through a LAN. This reality right now is the applications have spread across private cloud, public cloud, endpoints such as IoT devices and even your data centers. And if you look at all these applications, they're distributed in nature and there are different bosses or silos which are looking at them. At different, uh, with different kind of lenses in place. It's really hard to look there and talk, but I'll, I'll try to cover as much as possible. So there are applications team, network team, storage team, infrastructure team, cloud teams, and Kubernetes teams. There are so many teams and silos, and everybody have their own set of tools looking at problems when your customer is facing any kind of issues with interfacing with these applications. And the challenge there is that all of these infrastructure stacks and the related tools come with no business context. They come up with the context of networking or application performance, or I'll get, tell you what's happening in security. But if you look at all these silos individually, they do not really matter at all. It doesn't matter if you're getting an alert that CPU usage on a given cluster is 100%. Who cares? At the end of the, end of the day, should you wake up for that 100% alert? Is it important for your application or your customer? That is what, what is critical, and hence what I'm trying to say over here is, most of the time there is very less or no business context when you're trying to troubleshoot or look into problems. And hence, you need more to solve for. I'm faster than the animation, as you can see. Um, so let me talk about what you need, right? You basically need something which we call full stack. A full stack uh, which provides you all the available data and can combine all these different silos together in a cohesive language which can be understood by all these different personas who are interacting with this data. And to that, Cisco's answer is full stack observability. While talking to thousands of our customers, we've been talking about what are the challenges they have been facing. When we acquired App Dynamics, we went to each of these customers and talked about application performance. When we had acquired uh, Thousand Eyes, we actually connected that application performance back to the network. However, customers still come back and say that I have multiple use cases and I want to make sure that I can tie everything back with a business lens or a context of a business when I'm looking at any piece of my infrastructure. I want to make sure that I'm able to monitor. However, traditionally monitoring has been painful for me because that has resulted in multiple tools and I'm not able to get full fidelity data. I'm able to either do metrics or events or logs or traces and everything has been in silos. Monitoring was just events mostly and as soon as you moved on to observability, you started getting metrics, events, logs, traces and different tools as well. Um, however, when we look at these different tools, the challenge is context switching. Still, users who are trying to troubleshoot are going from a metrics platform where they understand what is happening. 
it doesn't really tell them where it is happening, and that's where they go into an events platform and correlate events to look at where it is happening. Because events can tell you what has happened in sub at certain location or, a, or in an environment. And then why it is happening, which is the root cause. And for most of the time, they jump into a different tool for logging, which can tell you what is happening in logs and what, what are the signals which, are you, which you're seeing in logs. But with full stack observability, our goal is to be able to combine all these data points together and provide them in front of our customers with business context. And that business context is critical because that will tell you what is important and what is not. So that you can prioritize and spend time on what is critical for your business. And this is where Cisco has reimagined as to how do we want to go ahead and help our customers with full stack observability use cases which you saw on the previous slide. One way was that we acquired a bunch of products, we integrated them together, and that worked for a time being, helped the customers, but they did come back and tell us that, hey, I have 15 Cisco agents from different products running on a single application. They're all sending data back to your products. Great, but you know what? It's taking up CPU, memory resources, and management overhead for doing that. And then, you know, I have 15 different products which I'm using from you, which is running in AWS, which is great, but I have to pay 15 times the bill of ingesting or downloading data from cloud. Can you allow me to have a single agent which can talk to all my applications, infrastructure, and send data back to the backplane of Cisco, and then you can help me with different use cases which I want to solve for different personas which I have in my organization. And that's where uh, we started looking at how I can provide something called Cisco full stack observability, which can provide you full stack visibility in terms of starting to look at your business transactions or users down to the infrastructure. It can provide you insights where you're not just looking at a bunch of data, but you're looking at insights which are drawn using machine learning and artificial intelligence. And then ultimately, you want to take actions, either they're manual actions or fully automated to ensure that you can move from, pro from being reactive to a proactive mechanism of doing observability. And essentially, if you look at it, uh, if you deep down on each of these areas of performance, optimization, and security, there are different use cases which you want to solve for each of these personas. But the most important point is you should not lose the business context. So that's the challenge which was upon us when we started thinking about Cisco full stack observability platform. So there is a difference between Cisco full stack observability as a concept as to what customers want versus how you can deliver it. And to that effect, we have announced Cisco full stack observability platform today, which essentially is the single platform which is built grounds up for over the past couple of years in order to solve the problems which I've been talking about so far. Um, it is extremely high scale and performant. It provides a unified experience across all different domains. And most importantly, while it's built by Cisco, it is not for Cisco. It is for ecosystem of partners who can build on top of this platform so that our customers can consume what they want at the speed of their partners rather than at speed of Cisco. They don't want to rely on a single vendor to build all the capabilities while they can go to an ecosystem of partners who can build integrations for them on top of the single platform. That is the FSO platform. There are some unique uh, differentiations in terms of what the platform can do. The number one and the most important in my eyes is that it is built on an entity-centric relationship model. Now that's a mouthful and some engineer came up with that term. But the reality is it's, it's built on relations. Basically means that you can bring in data from different silos, which you have today, combine them together, build relationship between them, and then make sure that you're able to observe the entire relationship from top to bottom. For example, pods are a child of a node, node is a child of a cluster, cluster is a child of an application, application is a child of a location such as a plant or a manufacturing unit, and this, these manufacturing uni unit belong to Amsterdam. You can create these custom relationships so that you have a business sense of what you're looking at on the, on the platform. It is a cross melt, which means you no longer have to have different tools for metrics, events, logs, traces. It's a single platform with support for all different melt data types. And I think another unique dif differentiation is that it's built on open telemetry. So if you heard about, if you have anything to do with observability, you will hear about open telemetry. 
And I'm proud to say that we are the top five companies in the world who are contributing back to the open telemetry standard. And this platform is made for open telemetry and ensures that it can understand data from any open telemetry endpoint or collector. Whether it's open source or whether it's built by Cisco or by AWS or by any other open telemetry vendor. Um, I talked about AIML. I don't want to go ahead into definitions. You all understand that how we can baseline a bunch of data and start finding anomalies so that we can provide you insights rather than you having to look at raw data all the time. And finally, it's cloud sale, scale. Now, customers are going multi-cloud. It's very obvious. They're not sticking to just private cloud or AWS or Azure. They have all of them in some matter or, or so. And hence, we also build our entire platform on top of our public cloud so that it's it's scalable, it's reliable, and it can actually be um, deployed in many locations with the help of various public cloud providers which are out there. Hint, AWS is the platform on which we have uh, deployed for the first time. Now let me just take you through a couple of slides which gives you an example of what kind of applications we are building, and it's not just us, but also we are enabling the developers, whether it's first party, which is our own developers, or second party, which is any developer out there, whether it's our partner ecosystem of delivery partners or technology partners who can build on this top of this platform. So the good news is that the way we build the platform, uh, we ensured that any developer interacting with the platform gets a standard set of APIs uh, which can be leveraged to build solutions on top of that platform. Um, whether it is developer tools, APIs, UI components, or code samples, all of them are available to our own developers, and the same things are available to third-party developers. So we actually expand the ecosystem of developers which can build on top of this platform. And by the way, we launched it today. The documentation of this is already out so that people can start building or experiencing how to, be, how to build an application on top of this platform. And we started six months ago, we actually built the first application on it called App Dynamics Cloud. So App Dynamics Cloud is the modern version of APM observability used for Kubernetes-based application running on public cloud. That was our first experiment to begin with, and now it has become a GA product, which a number of customers are using, are going towards, because they want to go ahead and leverage something as modern as AppD Cloud built on this platform. And very quickly, customers came back to us and said, you have this platform, you can do Kubernetes-based uh, monitoring and observability. You did a couple of acquisitions, uh, namely Opsani and Replex. And these companies were niche players in Kubernetes cost management and efficiency. And the proof point of the platform is that within a couple of months, we were able to integrate both of these acquisitions as separate solutions on top of AppDynamics Cloud. So now, as you go through some of our booths and see the demos, you will see that you're not able to just observe Kubernetes, you're also able to optimize it and understand the cost of Kubernetes and see where you're doing wastage and how you can be efficient about running applications on top of a microservices architecture. Uh, that's, that's about building a new app and then extending it by adding capabilities on top of it. There are also examples where we are actually building a brand new solution or an application and one of the application or example is there are a couple of developers actually from our team uh, standing at the back. And some of them actually built something called a Space Fleet app. This is like a sample app. If you've been a developer ever or if you've interacted with them, you must have heard about Sock Shop kind of example, which tells you how to build on Java, for instance. Similarly, we've come up with Space Fleet, which is an example on how you can go ahead and build a solution on top of the FSO platform. It's pretty cool. It allows you to create a uh, uh, spaceships and rooms and torpedoes and all of these are signals like metrics, events, logs, traces. So if you go into our FSO demo booth, you will see the demo of Space Fleet, which is automatically connected to a Kubernetes cluster. So these like like two cousins who have nothing to do with each other, but because the platform has the power, you can connect them together and create a topology of spaceships with Kubernetes. It's not useful, but it gives you an example of what you can do with the platform, right? And the last thing is the API. Um, one thing which I kind of talked about earlier was metrics, events, logs, traces, which is great. A lot of solutions out there can do that. They have built databases which can store all these different data types over a period of time. But what they cannot do is unify all of these together with a single query language 
uh, we call it the unified query language, which actually supports all these entities or models, as well as supports pulling out information from metrics, events, logs, traces, databases, using a single query language. And using that query language, we actually built an open source plugin for Grafana, which can visualize everything which is available in the platform, and those dashboards are out of the box, and it's already a GA capability for App Dynamics Cloud as well as a tech preview for FSO platform. So again, these are some proof points which tell you that the FSO platform is real. We already have applications running on top of it, and very quickly we have an ecosystem or partner group which is trying to build new applications and extensions on top of what you already have. Um, I do have a couple of call outs, but I do have a few minutes. So let me kind of give you some details about what exactly is this solution and how it is built. If you are a developer in the room, you'll be happy to see the next couple of slides. If you are a marketing person, you would love the previous slides because they were all marketing. So here is one of the slides which talks about what goes into building a solution. As I said, the front seats would have been better because the font is small. But essentially what I'm talking about is how you can make sure that you not only build the user experiences, the data model, but also the uh, identity and access management on your solutions. And you can define alerts or health rules on those solutions as well. So if you are creating a space fleet app and you want different rooms, you want torpedoes, you want rockets, you can define all of those entities yourself. And then on top of that, you can define if the space fleet has four rockets, then I want an alert because I should always have six rockets. It's important to me. So an example to tell you that you are able to define health rules on any kind of metric event or log within the solution. Uh, I have another beautiful picture which I will share with you later because this monitor, as I said, was not invested in. It's a small one. Uh, but essentially, this is on the left hand side, we are look, looking at the architecture of the Cisco FSO platform. And the idea is that the platform is able to ingest data either through open telemetry or a custom collector like a cloud API collector. For instance, if you're using AWS, we talk to CloudWatch APIs and push the data into the platform. We go ahead and abstract all the entities. We store all the data after processing to the metrics, events, locks, and trace store. And then we are able to provide a unified query language through which you can query the data, or the UI can query the data. Um, again, uh, happy to talk to any one of you if you're interested in knowing more about the architecture or the developer part of the presentation which I touched upon. Here are a few sessions uh, which are talking about the FSO platform as well as the first application which is App Dynamics Cloud. A more important call to action would be to be able to go to the Cisco FSO or Full Stack Observability demo, which is right beside. I will be doing the same talk in an expanded fashion for 45 minutes tomorrow along with the demo, so you can see the demo in the DevNet Theater if you're interested. And there's an App Dynamics Cloud demo as well, which is available in the App Dynamics booth. So I would request you to go and see the FSO platform as well as App Dynamics Cloud in action in the booths so that you can learn about whatever I was talking about are just not marketing slides. They're actually real software running and you can experience them. With that, I have three slides which you can see are very important. It's about API insights, marketing, you can click that and get some gifts, I believe. And then the sec secure the future with zero trust security approach. I'll skip that. This is a nice one. If you have any feedback, if you like me, if you don't like me, please let me know or please let us know and we'll make sure that you get a DevNet goodie. With that, uh, I will pause. That was my time. I'll take questions now. So any questions? And I have this mic which, hello, might work. It works. It does work. Yes, oh, yes. <laughs> Any questions? No questions? OK, fantastic. If there are no questions, then I have time for the next speaker, which is Randy. Is it Randy? It is Randy. OK, awesome. All right. We're going to talk about security. If I were to read this title, I think my 20 minutes would be up, so I'm going to skip over. We're going to just focus on secure application. Anyone here hear about business risk observability this morning? 
Nodding heads, cool, cool. Yeah, it is wicked awesome. I've actually been working on secure application for like three and a half years as part of the team that originally came up with this idea of being able to get more value out of App Dynamics and being able to correlate security insights with applications insights. This day is a long time coming. Um, got a WebEx app. Uh, all the speakers here are ready to engage, answer questions. Feel free to join us in there to, call, to have a chat. And now I want to go through some numbers. We all like stats. I think it really brings home how important this whole conversation is. Um, I'm guessing everyone here uh, is familiar with the fact that digital transformation is happening. Uh, I think everyone's probably also aware that during the pandemic, if you didn't have a digital business, you didn't really have a business. Uh, so it's become all that much more important. And we've seen the growth continue to skyrocket. The other part of this that's really important is the expectation has changed. If you give a bad digital experience, that customer moves on, right? They actually see it as a slap in the face. It's such a, a unique uh, concept to think about, but it's really important, especially when you start thinking about it from a security perspective. <clears throat> when a customer engages with a company digitally, there is trust. I'm going to give you my personal information, credit card, or some kind of unique identifier, my health records. That trust can't be broken if it is, boom, that customer's moving on. So, Let's take a look at how much is spent. Six trillion. Six trillion US, six trillion US spent due to cyber crime. Let's compare that to R&D on renewable energy. Anyone have an idea how much is spent globally? R&D, renewable energy. About 20 some billion. How about healthcare for the entire world? Anyone have a number for that one? 8.5 trillion. Those numbers are too close. We're spending way too much and we're not getting a return on that investment, right? <clears throat> certainly not on the health side in some cases, but certainly on the security side. 800% increase in attacks since the launch of the UK and Russia war, right? So we're spending a lot of money. It's not slowing anybody down. Matter of fact, those attacks are actually resulting in breaches more and more and more. Breaches means that trust is broken. And then what does it mean for your actual company, right? There's a cost associated. <clears throat> I'm showing the US cost. Here in Europe, the laws are, are stricter, the fines are higher, there is more cost associated with every breach. Every personal record loss is impacted to the business, not just fines, but also that loss of trust, the customer moving on. <clears throat> Look how long it takes to find a breach, 200 and some days just to find there's a problem. Anyone here in security? IT ops? Yeah, we got one person in the back. <clears throat> so in any type of like IT world, your goal is to find a problem quickly and fix it quickly, right? Could you imagine a, day, like a time where it took you 200 some just to find the core of an issue that's going to cost your company that much money, just like that? <clears throat> and the other scary part about it, in about 24 hours, your data's gone. So you're not going to know for 200 days that the data's already been taken out. A lot of this has to do with the friction that exists between the app teams and security teams. They're not best friends. You don't see them hugging in the hallways. Why? Because the app teams want to move code faster, new features, new capabilities. Security team wants to get visibility, control over everything. So you have this like fire hose of, of code running out the window, and you've got security teams going, wait, 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 I want to check that code before it ships. And the app team's like, I don't have time for that. So this constant friction needs a solution, or we're going to end up in really bad spot. Log4j, anyone have their holidays ruined because of Log4j? Yeah, okay, okay. More heads nodded for that than anything else so far. Um, I think that's something that we could all get like tattooed on our arms, right? It, it is at least tattooed on our brains. What happened here was this horrible vulnerability gets announced. It's in pretty much every bit of code, everywhere that job is being used, and the security teams have to rely on the app teams to say, where is it? Help me remediate it. And the app teams are like, well, I'm not sure where it is. Okay, that's a problem. All right, now we need you to go like rebuild your app and push it to production. I can't rebuild the app now. I don't know what's going to happen. All this friction meant it took months for a lot of companies to completely remove this extremely dangerous vulnerability from their environment. So we believe we have a solution. Surprise, surprise, right? Our solution is to leverage the app dynamics agent architecture and double dip. We have these agents, millions and millions of agents deployed all around the world in these enterprises monitoring the health of our customers' applications. Let's stick security inside of that. 
right? We already have security at the perimeter, firewalls, IPS, et cetera. We've got security in the operating system looking for operating system anomalies and things that shouldn't be there, but there really wasn't much looking at the code as it's executing. So we said, let's bake security right into that agent. And what are we doing once we're in there? We're doing three core things. Number one, do you have vulnerabilities in your code? Two, do we see any attack activity or any threat activity? And then finally, allow you to configure policy to say, I don't want that to happen, I want it to stop, and actually control the behavior of the code. Now, this bottom line is the essential part. Um, Sonny mentioned it too, it's all about context, right? It's like if, you, if someone tells you, oh, there's been an accident, you're like, oh my gosh, that's, that's not good, but who's involved? Where did it happen? All that context matters. Same with, hey, you've got a vulnerability. Great, where? What's going to impact? Without that context, it's kind of meaningless. So we bring that all together because AppDynamics already has the context. So the first thing we do in regards to vulnerabilities is the agent that sits inside the code can say, all right, what libraries are you actually using? A great example, let's go back to log4j. Someone says it just can't exist on the operating system. Okay, that's true, but is there any code that's actually using it? Because that's where the real problem is and we need to deal with it first. So that's what we're able to say, what libraries are actually being used. Determine what vulnerabilities are in there, bubble that up, alert you, that you can go in there and take a, uh, fix it. It's also constantly monitoring for those vulnerabilities. It's also monitoring runtime behavior, access to file system, network, et cetera, looking for whether or not you're actually using vulnerable code. So you can have a vulnerability, you can even load it in your app, but if you're not using the actual vulnerability, maybe it doesn't matter. Or maybe you're going to prioritize something else. So we're going to say you're using the actual vulnerable method or the vulnerable code that you need to go address. Then we're going to start looking at those runtime behaviors to see if there's any attack activity or maybe just some threats that might be worth investigating. Are you communicating with a known bad actor? Are you using that vulnerable code that's resulting in some type of file system access? We'll bubble that information up and give you insights to those attacks. And then finally, I was saying about policy. You can control it through our policy engine. Log4j again, in this particular example, you could go in, spend a total of about 30 seconds, and any workload that was being monitored by Secure App would stop that exploit from occurring. Right? Imagine, three months, 30 seconds. I think you guys know you would prefer 30 seconds, right? Now that's all what we already do. It's already amazing as is, but we went a whole nother level up and beyond. Business risk observability allows you to prioritize in a way that security has never done before. It's always been based off of a model of, hey, I've used, like, for vulnerabilities, a CVSS score. It's critical, it's high, I have to deal with that. Great, but again, what's the context? Do I want to go fix my cart checkout service or do I want to go fix my health check? That's just monitoring my service availability. Service availability, probably not a priority. Cart checkout, yeah, I make lots of money from that. I want to make sure that's secure. So with business context and bringing together the insights we already had, plus additional insights that we pulled in from other Cisco tools like Kenna, Panoptica, Talos, we now can give a complete perspective of the application context, business context, threat environment, and vulnerability insights. Bring them all together for business risk. To understand risk, oh, this is a very simple calculation. right? It is, what's the likelihood that I'll be exploited? And then what's the impact if I am exploited? You need those two, simply multiply them together and boom, you get business risk. It sounds really simple, but we have to pull from a lot of different places to be able to have a full understanding of what is that impact and what is that likelihood. And like, luckily, we've got access to all of that information within Cisco's portfolio. So where are the places that we are looking? This is just an example transaction of a cart checkout. You've got a user out on the internet, they can access your business transaction. All right, and, and let me actually back up. Business transactions, sometimes this gets a little bit of, a little muddy for people. It's basically the end-to-end -end experience that you are uh, delivering through a number of dependencies and services. So, cart checkout as an example. You might be doing one click to check out, but behind the scenes there might be 10 different services that are being spun up. There's a database pull, maybe there's a third party API that's involved. All of that has to be looked at holistically to be able to deliver that business experience. So we take this business transaction and we look at, is it internet accessible? It is, okay, that's going to increase the likelihood of exploit. 
and we say, all right, is this important to you or not? Are you actually mo actively monitoring this business transaction? Some are just automatically detected, you don't care about them. Some you curate and you manage because they're very important to your business. We, we capture that. Next, is there exploitable vulnerability? Not just the vulnerability, is it exploitable? Is there a path to the vulnerable code? What's the likelihood based on real world activity? Are you using third party unsafe APIs that's introducing risk? Is there threat activity? Maybe one of your services is reaching out to a known bad actor. Does it have access to a data store? Like all of this is typically done, if you ask anyone like a CISO, how do they handle risk? They've got a spreadsheet, right? They have a CMDB maybe. They have someone who wrote some custom code and they pull from 10 different tools and they try to figure it out or someone just manually says, this is important, this is risky, this is scary. We have now automated all of this and more to give you business risk scores. A lot of the intel that we are providing that's also being announced here at this event is the integration to Panoptica for third party API security risk insights as well as Kenna for vulnerability insights. And we bring them all together in a completely native behind the scenes way, at no cost I should add, our kind offer to our customers, they can just go ahead and turn it on and we're going to give them all these insights automatically without any effort. And I'm going to go through those in more, a little more detail. Uh, why Kenna? This is why. Like CVEs are coming out at 67 on average, 67 per day. And most enterprises can remediate one out of 10 every month. It is impossible to keep up with the number of vulnerabilities coming up. So what do you do? You only have to squash the ones that truly matter. Kenna helps with that. They're focused on the likelihood of exploit. And they do that through a number of vulnerability and threat feeds that they have from real world um, um, uh, products that sit out as like sensors, collecting information about actual exploit activity in the wild. They also have a store of historical data and they feed this all into a machine learning algorithm that comes out with the predictability of exploitability, provides insights as to whether there's active internet breaches, are there a proof of concept exploit code available, are they seeing people actively exploiting it? All of that information bubbled into this Kenna score. Why is that important? If you followed the model of a CVSS score, you might actually be focusing on the wrong things. Kenna score is going to give you the, uh, the ability to focus on what matters most. Here's a prime example of that. In a typical remediation model, following the CVSS approach, you're talking over 100,000 vulnerabilities that need to be remediated just at critical or high, ignoring medium and lows. That's the typical enterprise practice. Then you use a scanner approach, and they come out, what are your high risk? There are over 100,000 as well. Using Kenna's approach, determining what's actually happening, volume and velocity of attacks in the real world and historical data, it's 1% of all those vulnerabilities within this particular enterprise that we surveyed needed to be addressed. That's a huge time savings and prioritization um, savings. It also uncovered vulnerabilities that, although might have been categorized as low, needed to be addressed. The next one, API security insights. Here, AppDynamics already has understanding of all the APIs used to deliver those business transactions. We take that information, hand it off to Panoptica. Panoptica goes analysis on those and provides back insights. Tells us perhaps what version of TLS they're using. Are there any known vulnerabilities on those third-party APIs? <clears throat> That's an insight that most organizations don't have. So let's make it real with a little demo here. This is the AppDynamics uh, admin UI. You can see this is the flow map. This is the overall health of an application. But what we want to dive into are the actual business transactions. As we were talking about before, that's what actually matters to understand that end-to-end -end experience the customers are having. We can see here this you know, application, the patient portal was just launched. We've got a number of BTs. One of them is health records. Obviously sensitive data in a BT, but we've got business risk here we want to dig into. We can now look at the actual components used to deliver the business transaction, right? So we see a database, we see backend APIs, and a service. Um, on the right, you'll see the security health for this particular business transaction. We've got some vulnerabilities, there's no attacks, um, and that business risk is not just the vulnerabilities. As you remember before, is it internet facing? Is there data that's accessible? All that comes together for the score. If we want to look deeper into what comprises that, we can look into the Secure App UI where we get the score and a trend over time. So if you want to identify, are we actually having an impact on reducing risk or is it trending up, captured here. 
This one people love because if we go back to that whole 67 vulnerabilities found today, you really want to know like, what are the three things I can actually accomplish right today? What can I go do? We're going to tell you the three vulnerabilities that have the largest impact on reducing your overall risk for that particular business transaction so you can take action now instead of getting overwhelmed. Down at the bottom is where we group all of our security insights. You can see that the vulnerabilities we have listed here. I want to dive into the second one. And this is a prime example of where Kenna starts to play into the mix. Most organizations would have ignored this vulnerability because it is low. Don't care, it's a low on the CVSS severity, right? I'm not going to do anything about it. But Kenna says, actually, based on hysterical data, we believe this is an exploitable vulnerability, and it's a popular target. We're seeing active activity around this in the real world right now. So although it's low, you better go and prioritize this above something else. Now we can do the flip of that. Let me show you the libraries for this particular um, application. I'm going to go and filter it based on CVSS score for high and critical. The flip side is we've got one here that's critical for uh, Derby, right? For the Derby library. But Kenna has done an assessment on it and said, it's actually a 29, not something you need to worry about. Focus on feature delivery, right? Your development resources are precious. If you spin them up and say refactor your app to upgrade a library, that's super costly. So let's have them focus on what matters most. Tackle those ones that are that Kenna score that are really high. Tackle the business risk vulnerabilities that we showed before. Leave this one alone. If we head over back to the business transaction, I want to show you the Panoptica stuff. So here, we've cataloged all of the external APIs that are being used. First off, most security teams have no idea what APIs are being used. So you're giving them visibility without having to do any work. They ever ask, boom, point them here. Next, when we go off to Panoptica, they're able to determine what security issues are there. And they bubble those up. In this particular case, we can see that we're using a TLS version one. Now, in a highly regulated industry, in the healthcare space with sensitive data, that's a place where you do not want to be putting your, your data at risk. We bubble that up right in the UI. Now, the next thing I want to do is actually show how this is helping our customers, not just in production, which is essential, right? Because that's where your real risk is, but also shifting left to pre-prod. Almost all AppDynamics customers actually will do two deployments of AppDynamics. They'll do one in their production environment and one in their pre-prod. They want to determine, are there performance issues I should be aware of? And so what you can think about here is, imagine you could stop Log4j from ever making it back out into production. Right? Make sure you understood what risk our developers introducing before it ever sees the light of day. So business risk uh, algorithms work in the exact same way, whether it's pre-prod or prod, will tell you where that risk is. And you can see here in the testing patient portal, there's a number of other business transactions that have been identified with similar risk levels that need to be handled before they move to prod. So, I work for Cisco, I work for AppDynamics, I built this product, I love this product. However, it's not just me, I promise, right? We're getting awards for the work we've done here on Secure Application. Um, this one I'm super proud of, Gartner, number one of critical capabilities 2002 for security operation use cases. That's huge, right? I think they're realizing the power of bringing app teams and security teams together is the only way to do it correctly. Giving that context is essential. And what we're hearing, I want to tell another, I keep bringing back Log4j, but again, right, burned on the brain. When we had a customer who deployed Secure App, we actually had a free offer. Once this hit, I went to leadership and I said, offer it to all customers for free, get it deployed, get it out in use. Um, we had a customer roll it out, and the IT ops manager wrote back and said, I was finally able to sleep tonight, thank you. Right? That's the goal, is can we get IT teams and security teams feeling like they can get their job done and be comfortable knowing that they're protected uh, and working together with a shared context? Um, a plug, survey session, please. Love to hear feedback. I'm going to be hanging around for a while, so if you have any questions, um, I'm not sure how much time I have. I probably used it all plus some, but happy to, to answer questions afterwards one-on-one. -on -one. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. So we're going to talk about AppD Cloud for Business for all of you out there, the great big crowd. Um, so AppD Cloud is one of our new products from AppDynamics, talking about taking cloud workloads in a cloud environment and being able to tie everything in to, a, um, to the infrastructure and to the business. So really it's all about how do we tie everything back to the business and make it business relevant. 
So real quick, as a foundation, we want to talk about monitoring versus observability. Because from our aspect, most people take a monitoring approach these days, and we want to go observability. So there's a lot of different things that go into this, and you can see them up here on the board, whether it's siloed approach versus cross-architectural, business outcome-driven, metrics, reactive. What's all that really mean? How do we break that down, and what's that about? You can think of it this way. Monitoring is measuring the internal state of a system. How's my CPU? How's my memory? What's that look like? Problem is, is if I walked into a VP's office or a CTO's office, I went, hey, had 80% CPU today and I fixed it. He's going to be like, so? <laughs> I don't care. But if I can go in with an observability, understanding how the IT environment affects the business, and I can say, hey, we spiked at 80, 85% on the server, but we got it under control before the application went down and affected our revenue, that makes a difference. That's what the VP cares about. How are we uh, supporting that business? So what is driving observability these days? Well, first of all, 85% of us struggle to cut through all the white noise of all the data coming in. Applications have gotten extremely extremely complicated. i give you an example. There is a famous uh, amusement park that is outside of Paris. It's in Florida and it's in, uh, it's in California. So uh, Disney, they have an application that you can do everything in. You can unlock your room, you can pay for stuff, you can mobile order food, you can uh, reserve things for a ride, get into the park, everything's done through that app. For the user, everything's done for that app. For Disney, it's over 260 different applications in behind that support that one app that you're running on your mobile phone, which is amazing. But the fact is, we know that in these times with the recession and everything going on, we're forced to work and go through all that data with less resources. So how can we speed up that process and cut through that noise as people struggle with that and interestingly enough, 96% of people say there's dire consequences if they can't figure it out. My theory is the other 4% probably don't realize that and they don't have a job anymore. So <laughs> back to our Disney example, I can tell you a year and a half ago, it made national news in the United States. Disney's app went down. Their phone app quit working for an hour and a half, two hours and people were killing them on social media. How could a billion dollar customer or a company do this? How could you let all this happen? What's amazing about that is it came out later, it wasn't Disney's fault. It was an AWS outage. AWS had actually gone down and the outage was far enough that it took down their application and all their backup systems with it. So the app was down, down. Now, out of all of that, how many people do you think went back on Twitter and, they, and all the social media like, sorry, Disney, our bad. We didn't realize it wasn't your fault. It was really, they didn't care. They, they moved on to other things to complain about. Those are the consequences that we're faced with every day in IT environments and what that looks like. The problem is, is as these things have gotten more complicated, our way of supporting things has stayed the same. Everybody has their own piece of the puzzle that they're looking at. They're seeing the network, they're seeing the infrastructure, they're seeing the application. But in reality, we're still working in these silos to where we're not talking to each other. We're not understanding what the other person's doing and how their piece fits in and ours. And the real loser in all of this is the end user. The end user is the one who's suffering, and when the end user suffers, business suffers. And so we've got to figure out a way to cut through all that noise to get these teams to start collaborating again. Because the easy part is technology, the hardest part is the process and the people that we've spent decades of building our IT processes around. And the way we're doing that is with our full stack observability at Cisco. And this is the foundation of AppD Cloud. So AppD Cloud is actually a solution that's built on top of this architecture. This architecture allows us to ingest any data as long as it's in an open telemetry format, pull it in and we can digest that and correlate it together and bring it up into business use cases and business impact. 
That foundation is the core of what we run on, so being able to pull all that together. And we're going to take a look at what that means. Because the way we're storing that data and the way we're pulling that data together in relationships, it's no longer the parent-child relationship that you have to worry about. You can actually traverse up and down these relationships as you go through, even to second and third generations out. So if I am a Kubernetes admin, and I go in and look at my Kubernetes, I can go down and say, hey, there's a cluster here, and in my cluster, I know I've got namespace, and then I've got pods, and in these pods, I can see services. But services are part of APM, and because of those services, I can start tracing that back up all the way into a business transaction, which has business meaning. So you can go back and forth through there. And then someone may be a system admin running my host or my EC2 instances running out in AWS and procuring those, and they're looking at how everything runs, and oh, by the way, we put up a Kubernetes cluster on that EC2 instance, and that Kubernetes cluster has a pod, and I can see that now, and all that pod has a service, and so he can traverse through and see all those different relationships as they come out. That's where the key comes in to allow your teams to start talking together. So what's this look like? So from an AppD Cloud standpoint, when you go in, you can start by looking at those application performance metrics, or you can start from Kubernetes, or you can start uh, from the infrastructure. It doesn't matter where that piece is because you'll be able to interwind and go there. So when we're looking at those business transactions, typical flow map looks a little different than our traditional flow map, but still the same idea of being able to see those user transactions going through, but in this case, we can do it agentless because we're using open telemetry. So I'm actually pulling these spans and traces together and turning them into business transaction to understand what the user is doing inside. On the left, you'll start to see where all of this stuff comes down in the relationship. So think of the left side as a relationship tree that I can go up and down. So in this case, I'm looking at my services inside a business transaction but I can go down into the clusters and start looking at workloads and get down into my infrastructure. And in fact, if I dig down in and look at business transactions, you'll see I'm still getting into my pods and my hosts, my load balancers, my workloads. It doesn't matter because of those relationships that we're building automatically in behind. If you dig into those, and this is just a little further down showing more of the uh, stuff that we're doing uh, on the side of those relationships. But as you dig down into that, you can look at those individual services, and as you're troubleshooting again, bringing those teams together, in one screen, I've got my application service running, I'm looking at all the logs associated with that service in that Kubernetes cluster, I'm also looking at all the metrics that come off of that from an infrastructure standpoint and how it all fits together. Not from a high level view, but dissected down to that individual service running on that pod, running on a specific host or in a, uh, the EKS service. And then you can click in and actually see those logs and parse through those logs. So if you're familiar with things like Splunk and Elk, you get all those logs, but it's up to the user to be able to know how to navigate through there and pull everything. We're gonna pull it all in for you, correlated not only to the service, but again, to a metric, to a specific telemetry, to a specific event that goes on, all in one screen. And if you don't like those screens, <laughs> we have some fun for you. We just built and released a Kubernetes plugin that is completely open source and free to use. So you can go in and you can actually design your own dashboards using that uh, plugin so that you can see everything in Grafana. Sorry, it's Grafana plugin. Said Kubernetes, but they're the same. But we did that for open source. We know that a lot of people like Grafana. Um, we're not going to tell you how your dashboards should look. So we built that completely open source, and that went out uh, last week. And I will leave you with this slide, because this is the most important thing on why we do this, and it's enabling the business. It's being able to take what we, uh, the business and tie it to the user experience tied to the application, tied to security, tied to the infrastructure, tied into everything. But again, being able to do that so your teams can start talking together 
and have all of that information relevant at their fingertips correlated together so they can talk the same language and they're not all separated out looking at different pieces. Because when we can start to do that with our people and our processes, then we can really start to innovate on the business and impact our companies for the good. So with that, I thank you very much. <laughs>
as organizations and companies started to break apart their big monolithic applications into smaller and smaller modular microservices. This resulted into a massive amount of telemetry data that is generated now by all of these different services that have been decomposed and broken apart. And sure, you know, there is there was also a lack of a standardized data format, you know, for sending data to an observability backend. So if you wanted to switch your observability backend, you had to uninstrument your application, install new agents, reconfigure your instrumentation, load it into a new observability backend then go through and rebuild dashboards, rebuild everything from the ground up, and it was quite honestly a whole lot of work. So the goal for OpenTelemetry is to provide a set of standard and vendor agnostic APIs, SDKs, and tools to be able to manage observability data and send it to your back end of choice. So I'm going to flash a little bit of an architect high level architecture slide for OpenTelemetry. And so, in a nutshell, this is what the OpenTelemetry standard is aiming to provide. A single vendor neutral instrumentation library per supported language, uh, support for being able to instrument, etched, I'm sorry, instrument applications both automatically and manually to be able to get out that telemetry data. An end-to-end -end implementation for generating, emitting, collecting, processing, and exporting data. Full control of data, which is a really important aspect of this, because by having an open standard here, it allows customers to be able to choose their back end of choice without having to go through and change how they're instrumenting applications. Open standard semantic conventions, so we settle upon a common way of naming things. And then finally, support for multiple context propagation methods. So in order to be able to associate things further downstream, we need to be able to provide multiple ways to have that data persist along. Now what open telemetry is not, it's not an observability backend. There are plenty of those that are on the market, uh, both open source and uh, commercial offerings. I, I'm part of the App Dynamics business unit. I think we have a great solution. I'm also a little bit biased. So, so one of the things, the next thing that I really want to get into is how we're embracing open telemetry at Cisco and Cisco App Dynamics. I'm just going to flash this up here real quick. And so we can see, you know, as we look at the far left end of the chart, there was some contribution, you know, whether it's, you know, the number of contributions that were being made or the number of people that were working on the project and the standard. But there's definitely a big upward trend on this. Uh, I believe today uh, during the opening or during the keynote for today, Liz Santoni mentioned uh, about how we are actively contributing to the open telemetry standard and how we're all in on it. Um, I'll throw some statistics up here real quick. Um, for all time contributions, we're number 12 out of all corporate organizations that are contributed to the standard. Uh, for all time, we are number 10 with 700 pull requests. Uh, and for the number of contributors all time, we're number four. But if we look at things from the last 12 months, we, are, we have the most contributors to the open telemetry standard over the last 12 months. So what I hope that is demonstrating is Cisco isn't just paying lip service to contributing to the open standard. We're actually putting our money where our proverbial mouth is and getting people in to contribute. And the data that I'm flashing up here was as of the end of January. So there may be some fluctuation on that and I can provide updated information. But as of around the end of January, we have 15 members who are established within the community, uh, six people who are project approvers, and then one project maintainer. And then I'll also list a 
you know, number of the uh, contributions that we have made to the open telemetry standard, um, such as, you know, OAuth 2 authentication, um, HTTP instrumentation for both Apache and Nginx, uh, JMS metric insights, uh, container resource detection. Uh, I won't read the whole list, it's right there, pretty easy to see. So in order to really understand, you know, what is all the buzz about for open telemetry, we need to understand some definitions and we need to hit on some core concepts. The first one being what the heck is observability? You know, so you, you can ask 10 different people, you get 10 different definitions, but this definition right here is from, uh, uh, is, I believe it's from the open telemetry website. So what observability does, it allows us to understand how a system is behaving from the outside by letting us ask questions and ask for information without understanding how the inner workings of a system work. So in order for that to happen, that system has to be able to spit out telemetry information, metrics and logs and traces, to be able to understand how is it working, you know, infer and understand, you know, how that system is performing without being intrusive into the inner workings of a particular system. What observability is not, it's not monitoring. Sometimes the terms are, are thrown out interchangeably, but they're very different. With observability, it's inferring the state of a system by seeing what information and what telemetry is being emitted and, and making our uh, conclusions from that information. When we look at monitoring, we understand the inner workings of the system. We know how the code is behaving. We know the architecture of the system. So we're able to get more granular into the workings and be able to understand the information. They both have their place, but again, Observability relies on asking for information and telemetry from a system without knowing the internal workings. Monitoring takes it a step further by knowing how the inner workings are in place. Those emitted pieces of information, the metrics, the logs, the traces, within the open telemetry standard, those are known as signals. And so there are four official types of telemetry that are supported by open telemetry and our official signals. Uh, those are metrics, logs, traces, and baggage. There is a fifth one that is underway that is being worked on for profiling. Uh, that is still in development and has not been, you know, put into an alpha or beta stage yet. So I've omitted that from this slide, but know that it is in progress and that it is underway. And so, Metrics, that's pretty self-explanatory. It's probably the most mature of all of the open telemetry signal types. It's a measurement. It's a measurement about a service captured at the runtime of the service. It could be a counter such as uptime of a service or number of CPU throttles that have occurred. Uh, it could be, you know, you know, it could be something that's just a aggregation or a measurement such as calls per minute. Or it could be a, another type of metric such as you know, a, a, a CPU percentage or you know, uh, an average response time. Metrics as a signal type within open telemetry are in a mostly stable state because it's pretty cut and dry. There are some edge cases and some edge scenarios that are still being actively developed and actively worked on because they are, you know, this is a continually evolving standard and a continually evolving specification. But for all intents and purposes, it's a stable uh, signal type. The next one is logs. Logs are probably the most popular uh, signal type for organizations when they're going through and triaging issues because it's a record of exactly what happened at a specific point in time. Um, it's time stamped and there's associated metadata that comes with that particular timestamp. 
and it's in that metadata that tells us exactly what happened at that point in time with that service. Uh, you may have heard reference to the MELT stack, you know, MELT being an acronym for metrics, events, logs, and traces. In the case of the OpenTelemetry standard, events are just a very specific type of log that follows a very specific set of semantic conventions. So events and logs for the purposes of OpenTelemetry are one and the same. And any data that comes into a system that's not a trace and that's not a metric is, consumed, is assumed to be a log just by pure process of elimination. And I keep mentioning traces, so I should probably explain what it is. So it's just a record of paths that are taken you know, by requests that are made into a distributed system. Uh, this helps us identify where bottlenecks are occurring. Um, this allows us to actually break down which segments of a, our particular application are, are causing our bottleneck and our, our uh, performance problems here. And so, by this, it almost becomes hierarchical and, it's, and it comes into that parent-child relationship. So traces have one or more logical units of work that are called spans. And each, there's at least one span for every trace that comes in, but spans can have zero or more child spans. So think of it as if you want to look at a good analogy, uh, think of it as a segment in a network path. So if you're traversing from one router switch to another router switch, that segment could be treated as a span in the context of open telemetry. This is probably the second most mature signal type uh, within the open telemetry specification, right behind metrics. It's, a, it's really close. Uh, so it's a fairly stable specification. Again, there are some edge scenarios that are still being defined and that are still being worked on that are considered in that experimental or alpha state. And then finally, there's baggage. We all have baggage. I've got baggage. I got more baggage than I want to deal with. Uh, but that's just for this trip. Um, in order for us to be able to fully understand and to be able to tie things together when we're troubleshooting, sometimes we have to pass information along. Um, for example, if I'm looking at a, um, an e-commerce type of application and I'm having issues with a particular functionality, but it only occurs in specific scenarios, like if there's a shopping cart that has, that's given me problems, but it's not every shopping cart, it's only if they have a specific set of items or a specific quantity of items, you know, some bizarre scenario like that. We need to be able to send that context along and perpetuate it as we go throughout our you know, distributed services within the application. As part of the open telemetry spec, once a span is created, you can't change it. It's immutable. So what we have to do is we have to, we have to add some baggage along so that it tags along with the request. And so that's what we refer to as uh, the baggage type. It's not one that is, it's probably the least known of all the signal types, but it is in a, in a pure stable state. Um, it's passed along as key value pairs that persist in HTTP headers. So because it is being transported that way, there is the potential for that information to be leaked. So we don't necessarily want to put information in baggage that could be potentially sensitive. And so those are the four signal types that are right now uh, supported officially by OpenTelemetry. We're generating all of this data, we're generating all of these, all of this telemetry, this metrics, these traces, these logs, and we've got baggage that's tagging along with them. We've got to send it somewhere to, for it to be processed and to be handled. Could you send it directly to an observability backend such as App Dynamics? Yeah, you could, but in order, the best way to do that is in the form of an intermediate collector, because you may want to be able to add additional data to it. You may want to be able to, you know, decorate it with additional attributes that you know, you know, are going to happen further down. And so that's where the collector comes into play. 
there are four primary parts. Uh, we've got receivers that take in the data. We have processors that do additional things to the data, whether it's add additional metadata to a trace, or it batches it up for sending to a back end in one big clump. And then we have exporters, which is how we send it out. Um, a lot of times it goes over a standard, uh, standard protocol. Uh, there are exporters that go directly to Jaeger or Prometheus. Uh, there are also extensions that add additional functionality that don't tie to directly manipulating or handling uh, telemetry data. And it's all configured uh, via YAML. So sections are defined for receivers and processors and extensions and exporters. Uh, that's all defined in YAML, but just defining it doesn't necessarily activate it. You have to put it into a, a service section within our YAML file. And that service section defines the pipelines that are used to be able to handle the data. It's, it's almost like a little bit of a, um, an uh, inverted ETL process. You receive data, you do something with it, you send it somewhere else. Order matters in how you specify uh, the processes that are part of your pipeline. So if you put you know, one, one particular uh, processor before another, it's going to execute in that order. Um, one thing in, that's interesting to note, um, if you need to authenticate to a backend system to be able to send it telemetry data, that is available as extensions for the collector. So we have taken our, you know, we've, we've gotten our telemetry data, we've collected it, but I keep talking about instrumentation. And so instrumentation is libraries that we add in or code that we add in to be able to get our services to emit those logs and traces and metrics that we can collect and then send to our observability backends. Uh, most of the popular languages are supported. Java, .NET, Erlang, PHP, Go. I won't read the whole list up there. Uh, there are some languages that are in development such as uh, Perl. Perl is one that comes to the top of mind. Uh, but if you work with an obscure language that's not supported, you're absolutely free to go and build your own SDK and add your own code to collect that telemetry data. That's what the spec is for, and it's kind of a cool thing, especially if, you're a, if, you, if you like to tinker with code. And so I have demos up here. The first thing that I want to show is there is an official demo that is supported by the Open Telemetry Group. Uh, there's the URL to it. It's just a redirect to the GitHub repo that hosts the official Open Telemetry demo. Uh, I've got it in a convenient QR code format, so you can just scan and go. Uh, and in that are examples of how to do it within multiple languages. So there's a lot of services that are written in Go, uh, some Java, some uh, Python, and it's a really good resource if you're wanting to get a good introduction to Open Telemetry. And so this right here, this was a screenshot that I grabbed from an App Dynamics controller of what a purely instrumented application using Open Telemetry looks like. Um, it's going to look a lot like other, you know, what you would see in other observability systems. But again, this is going to reinforce how App Dynamics and Cisco are both embracing the Open Telemetry standard and specification. And what I want to do real quick before we wrap it up is just to show the sample, a sample application of what we were just looking at on the screenshot. So this one is a, um, a modified version of the Google Hipster Shop demo. So someone pulled out all of the Google specific uh, instrumentation and replaced it with open telemetry. So we took that, uh, I am not sharing, am I? That, why am I not? Okay, so I will, there we go. So we, we have a, a specific uh, implementation of the hipster shop demo that goes in and we ripped out all of the Google specific instrumentation with, and replaced it with open telemetry. Uh, it's a fairly standard, you know, fairly standard deployment within Kubernetes. We have microservices, multiple languages. Uh, but what I want to call out is, uh, let's see, I, what I want to call out is this was the collector that was set up before where we went in, we, you know, by default, we are sending data to, um, to Jaeger and, and logging to standard out within the collector. And literally just by going in and adding in 
uh, some processing and another exporter, we were able to take that the same telemetry data that's being generated and send it to a different observability backend, such as App Dynamics. And so this, what this does is it shows the flexibility of the platform, it shows the flexibility of the standard, and as we go, and we'll talk about this in the session on Thursday, how we can take this architecture and turn it into a little bit more of a complex deployment and complex architecture and pipelines. So let's wrap it up because I'm actually running late, so I'm sorry. I want to flash up some additional resources. Um, some really interesting blogs. You have the open telemetry documentation. Uh, there's a really great weekly newsletter called Ollie News, uh, 011y.news. Uh, the primary author of that is Michael Hasenblas from AWS. Uh, then we have uh, below it a, a more advanced uh, topic around building your own open telemetry collector. Uh, and then finally, again, uh, reference the demo application that's supported by the open telemetry group. Recommended sessions. I have to pitch my session again, Thursday 2.15. I'd love to see you there. Um, a couple of other sessions that would be really useful and good for uh, observability. Uh, there's one on Thursday, uh, Thursday after mine, uh, which is observability starts here. Enhance and add value to your cloud native capabilities. And then the final one, uh, BRKCLD2158, uh, which is just around cloud native observability. Uh, that one is done by uh, Shannon McFarland, who's a distinguished engineer at Cisco. Fantastic guy, super sharp, highly recommend it, 10 out of 10. And with that, thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs>